Nation, we are back with another Black Window Cream podcast, new episode every single Wednesday and Sunday. I'm your host, Ben Haggerty, a.k.a. Ben Real Verse World, and this is episode 191. Today's guest is EDM photographer Rooks. Rooks has been in the game for over 15 years and has worked with damn near every top performing EDM artist and music festival ever. In today's episode, we dive into Rooks' entire career, covering topics such as how he climbed the ranks from club photography to getting discovered by Dead Mouse, what it was like exploring South Africa with Swedish House Mafia, as well as watching Skrillex's rise from opening act to headliner, how he utilized his own website as a platform for EDM fans to find photos from concerts concerts and festivals which allowed him to develop his brand as a creator. His advice for building longevity as a photographer, strategies when covering festivals, and his perspective on being one of the main photographers documenting the massive growth of EDM. We cover all this and so much more, but if this is your first time tuning in the podcast, you are probably wondering. What the fuck is Black With No Cream? Great question. Black With No Cream is the illest educational resource for content creators fueled by caffeine. Or at least I take my coffee Black With No Cream, but you can drink or not drink whatever caffeine you fuck with and still be a part of our community. We have thousands of members from all around the world working together by sharing content, asking for feedback, passing tips and tricks along to one another with the goal of pushing each other to become the best motherfucking content creators on earth. And you can join our private group if you want to by going to bwnc.com slash join. We would love to fucking have you. Please join. I'm excited for you to listen to this episode today. Rooks is a super nice dude with a gang of experience. So be prepared to take notes during this episode and send us a screenshot um, on Instagram so we can see what you took away from this episode at Black With No Cream. Also, if you are really just like the biggest fan of Black With No Cream podcast and you want to see us grow this platform, join our street team by texting us. We will be texting out updates on future episodes and ways that you can get involved to help spread the word about Black With No Cream. Um, We want to use this as a way for you to share your input, provide ideas for upcoming episodes, and we will also kick you some weekly motivation and inspiration that we get from each podcast episode. So do that. Here's the number. 319-209-9041. We also made a link that's in the description, so it'll load up my contact a little easier for you. But say what's up, introduce yourself, I'll hit you back soon. And uh, without further ado, I bring to you my episode with Rooks and the most epic podcast intro ever created. Right motherfucking now! Yo, ladies and gentlemen, we have the one and only, the number one, as quoted, number one DJ photographer, Rooks. Yeah. How you doing, bro? Good. How are you? I am. I am amazing. It's a. It's another day in paradise out here in, in COVID city. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, yo, you you have some amazing work, and thank you for reaching out to us. I, I was glad to see you pop up in the DMs. You're like, let's do a podcast sometime. I'm like, please. That would be awesome, <laughs> um, dude. You. I feel like. From having done the research I've done, and uh, my partner Dave, he also is a, a fan of your work too. You've been in the game for a minute, and I feel like paid the way for a lot of concert photographers, especially in the EDM scene. Is that true or false? I think that's true. Yeah. <laughs> how long have you been? How, how long have you been shooting uh, like live concerts? Um, about fifteen years now. Holy shit! And, and yeah. I think that what's so cool is that you know I would, I would like to kind of. I'll, I'll, I'll create a path for this, but what I've seen and what I've noticed is like you've built this large fan base through having so many connections in this in the EDM scene and building so many personal relationships with these different artists. Um, and is that from the default of having uh, kind of been one of the first people that were actively getting into clubs, actively going into shows and being willing to shoot photos? Because I feel like when you started, it wasn't oversaturated like it is right now with people having DSLRs and trying to get into a concert. Oh, yeah. Definitely not. I mean, definitely had to had to deal with a lot of um, just being one of the first because, like, when I started, every I was like, I want I want something to do on the weekend. I looked at club photos and like, oh, cool, you get to see like cool people and go to see DJs and everything. But pretty much everything I saw was just about the people going to the parties. It was all just like here, like I'd go to like a gallery, like a DJ that I like was playing, and it would be like. 99% 99% pictures of the people at the event and then like one or two blurry picture of the DJ. And really? I'm like, I kind of want to do something a little bit different, you know? Right. I, uh, and I just noticed like all the DJs that I was fans of never really got well represented. They're just like go to a club and then just be like, like I said, tons of people pictures and like one or two pictures of them. And I'm like, I think they kind of would want their artists. They would probably appreciate 
an actual good photo of them as if they were just like a rock band or a pop band or something, you know? Yeah. That's what I was going to say. Cause I feel like at the time it would have been a popular thing to do, to go in and shoot whoever the rock band is. Like that's what they wanted was these photos of these rock stars, but DJs at the time, maybe it, it, it was so new. Cause that was kind of the beginning of that era. Right. Yeah. It was kind of the crossover between like a DJ kind of being like the back end music to like, Oh, these people are actually getting famous and they're producing albums and their tracks are getting pretty popular, you know? And it just kind of was like, I looked at it like, would a Getty image photographer go to a U2 concert and take pictures of the people in the crowd no. or you do. Yeah. And I kind of, that was kind of like my idea of like, I think I should try to do something like that. That's so, so do you recall at that time, do you remember any other photographers that were following that similar, similar path or do you feel like it just kind of dawned on you and you, you were kind of in your own lane? I mean, I think the only, I knew, I know some photographers that would do artist photography and DJ stuff, but pretty much all of them worked for like wired agencies, mm. you know, like Getty and stuff like that, because they were just like, here, get a picture of Paul Oakenfold or some DJ, just so we have a photo in case he comes up in the news. No one was, no one that I knew of was actually going out specifically just to get photos of the DJs. Right. And, and at that time, when you're saying like all you saw were, you know, people, the crowd shots and things like that. Were those on like the, the venues websites or was that from the DJs posting that on their websites? Where were these hosted at? Cause this is before um, Instagram. Back then there were a lot of just like party aggregate kind of websites like club plan and stuff where they were just basically promote all the club nights and then send a photographer out to take pictures of the people. And then the people would have to go on the website to get their photo right. and then see the next, see the upcoming events. And it was just like a cycle of that kind of thing. Mm. And yeah, it was like, I started at Avalon in LA. I started doing that when in, in 2005 and I was doing with the artists, but they were so impressed with the, what I was doing for the club and not like getting too many pic people pictures that like the beginning of 2016 is like, okay, we want you to be the first announced photographer this club has ever had. Wow. That's insane. So that's, yeah. I mean, and for people who don't know, Avalon is a massive place to, to get your start, <laughs> to kick yeah. it off with at this point, like people would kill to have access to stuff like that. What, what would yeah, be, it was, it was funny. Cause it was at that time, like I would always, uh, look at the upcoming events. And for some reason, like all the DJs that I liked, like Sasha, Junkie XL hybrid and all those people would all be playing week after week at Avalon, like every week. And I'm like, Oh my God, this is amazing. Cause yeah. it'd be the biggest club and they'd have the most money to afford the biggest DJs. So it kind of worked out pretty well. Right. And so you just had so, instant access. Did, did you, uh, for, for advice, I guess, uh, kind of looking at if a creative, if a, if a photographer now is trying to get access to a, a platform like that, like say, and become an in-house DJ or DJ photographer an in-house photographer for any venue, what's some advice you would give to them now having the experience of you did all that and now you've built all these different types of relationships. What advice would you give to someone that's trying to break into the scene now? I mean, basically it's just, it's, there's always, it's, it's right. Like right now, of course, it's a little bit difficult because the past few years it's, um, like as I was getting bigger and bigger, it was kind of like big DJs and then newer DJs would be propped up and they would start climbing the ranks. But now lately it's like the past few years, it's been a little stagnant where it's been kind of like, here are the big DJs and there are some up and coming DJs, but we won't really do much with them. So it's like mm. a little disjointed where like the people that are trying to get big are not getting big as fast as they used to. Right but still they always have the need for social media is still a huge driving force because they always have the need for photos and stuff like that. And they need to look good. So if you're just starting out, if you start out with another artist that's starting out, you help them with their brand. So if you make them look good, they'll make you look good. Right. And you grow with them, you know? Right. And when, and when you were, you know, you explore, you became this in-house photographer at the time and, and you're doing that for about how long until you, you start kind of building relationships with artists directly? Um, about two or three years, actually. It was just, it just like the whole, the whole way I started networking just to get from doing club photography to doing festivals and like dead mouse and touring with our artists was like pretty quick. And it was just very, it overlapped yeah. a lot. What, what, what was it about dead mouse that, uh, I remember, you know, going back that time, I'm in Iowa when I grew up, I was in Iowa and 
I remember seeing Dead Mouse play this show at some club and it was just looked, it was the most insane thing I've ever seen. And this was like my introduction to EDM at the time was seeing like what these club performances and what clubs look like. And it was him towering over people. I think it was like a Halloween show or whatever. So I remember mm-hmm. seeing that and seeing how massive this was. And I'm like, what the fuck is this? This is around <laughs> the same time that you are starting to work with them. What, what, how, how, what was it about you that made him interested in you to take? Cause then he did, you ended up going on tour with him. Yeah. Yeah. So what, how did that relationship start and how did you kind of build that with them? It was just, it was a lot of networking and just things that worked out well. So basically I worked it out. Um, I worked it out. It's, it's crazy when you think about it because it's just like this crazy family tree that you could just trace every little thing <laughs> right. that branches out to that. And then just looking back, I'm like, Oh my God, that's amazing that it all happened. Mm-hmm. So basically I worked at Avalon, the promoter was giant and they did a night in Orange County um, on Thursdays at the same time, uh, pioneer, they, the U S division, they kind of like needed some photos of DJs actually using the CDJs. So right. they would just like hit me up every time. Like, Oh, you got a good shot of this person using the DJ. Can we license it? And then through that, um, at the same time, Tommy Lee from Molly crew, right. Um, was starting his DJ DJ, like side gig with uh, DJ arrow. And he was playing, at one of the orange county gigs so my friend from pioneer invited me to come down to meet him and just like hang out and like oh this is tommy lee this is drew he's an amazing photographer and everything like that flex it's like cool cool get some pictures of me and everything like that and i took pictures of him just like chilling out and some good good gig pictures and then he just happened to say this was like at the end of 2017 he's like Oh, my friend, uh, dead Joel, who plays as dead mouse. He's just, just starting as a DJ and he's going to play his first ever gig in, I think LA okay. or the U S one of those two in like December of 2007 you should come along because I'm going to go there and support him. So I'm like, okay. And it's, it was this club circus, which is like this huge, like three or 4,000 capacity club. And I go there and it, there's only like 150, 200 people. There's like very little people, but all of them are complete diehard fans. Wow. So he introduced me to dead mouse and I just took my usual good pictures and he's like, Oh yeah, I heard of you because the person that took my press photos is a big fan of your work. So it kind of worked like that. And then he started, um, I think right after that in like 2008, he started doing like a big winter music conference run in Miami with Tommy Lee. And he's like, you should come along and take pictures of me at ultra and do all these side gigs and everything. And then I just kind of like, balloon from there where I went to doing a few gigs to eventually starting to tour with him. Right. And then he did his production and then that went to huge tours and everything like that. And at that time, did, did, was it typical for artists to have their own personal person with them? Uh, I feel like now it's kind of like a job role that's automatically, you have to fill it, especially if you're hitting a tour. Was it like that then? Especially if they, you were talking about going into these venues, no one's really capturing these people. They're not really the stars that they are now. Um, mm-hmm. so was that common, especially with, I'm sure they weren't even considering budgets. Not that at the time. I really noticed. I mean, like, yeah, like I said, it was just kind of like most of the time it was like, it was just like, Oh, well, if we go do this club in the middle in somewhere in the U S they'll have a local photographer. We'll just get pictures from them. Don't right. care if they're good or not. We'll just do it. But since that mouse had like the mouse had and actually had a brand that he wanted to look good. I think he just kind of got the idea that if he's taking good pictures, he could take good pictures of me and then it like psych it uh, dominoes from there. Right. And, and for him at that time, if you're meeting him kind of at the beginning of his launch, how quickly did it take for him to kind of explode, to start getting a buzz? And then with that explosion and you being with him for the whole ride, how does that start to change your career? Like personally, are you getting hit up by other artists? Are you starting to get helped by um, like companies and brands more so than you were before? Did, what, how how'd that go for you? Um, it was, uh, there were like a few more companies like music industry companies, but still at that time for the longest time, it was just dead mouse for a long, for a while. Yeah. So basically until he, until he came out with the cube production in like 2007 at Coachella and people were like, Oh my God, first half punk worth this production. Now dead mouse has one and he could bring it anywhere. Right. And then he started touring the world with it that's when all the other artists and DJs were like, well, if he could do it, then I could do that. You know, cause before it was like, Oh, Def Punk did this. I don't think I could ever do that. But he just basically said, look, if I could do it, you could do it. And then 
all the other artists were like, well, we got to think of production now and we got to think ahead of the game. Yeah. And then within like a two or three years, then artists started getting production, started hitting me up for tours and stuff like that. So how, how, how you know, obviously touring and traveling and hitting these bigger shows is completely different than shooting at Avalon. How, how, how were you mentally preparing yourself for those events? Or were you just kind of on the seat of your pants, like just trying to see what's going to happen next? How do I handle this? How do I stay prepared? How, how did you deal with that? It, it was a bit on the seat of the pan, on my pants, but it was, um, like you, like everyone knows once you go on tour, it kind of repeats and it's a little bit of the same thing. So you get into a good groove after the first few days. But I mean, being at Avalon taught me a lot because there was a good variety of artists. So they'd have like artists that were just like make some good projections on the screen and give me a lot of light. But then there'd be artists like Sasha who was like, I want no light. I want complete darkness. I want nothing. I just want maybe like a strobe or spotlight once in a while. Yeah. And I actually had to buy the uh, Canon 50 1.4 low light lens just to take pictures of him Wow! because I couldn't get, couldn't use the flash, couldn't get photos any other way. So that in turn helped me learn how to shoot at like 1.4 and get like low light photos and help me develop different ways too. Damn. That's crazy. Yeah. It yeah. definitely challenges you and, and sets you up for future issues that you're going to run into. I, 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 yeah. I, I, and then I, I would be like, and then I'd use it just for that. Then I'm like, but well, wait, what if I use, this lens in a place with a lot of light. Let me see what 1.4 looks like at this. And then I would try a lot. Then I got like one amazing shot. I'm like, okay, this is good. I should start doing some more stuff like right. this right now. That's and sick. then it just helped me develop and learn everything about cameras. At, and trial and error. at what point did you build your website? Cause I, it's it, that's what's so cool is that you've developed this engine behind you similar to like what I would, you know, I always coming up in hip hop and shit. That's all the music I really absorbed. I would, hip hop blogs all day long. I'm trying to figure out what's going on, what what's up with these artists, like behind the scenes content, et cetera. It feels like that's what you were doing with your, your Rooks website. Is that, is that safe? Pretty much. Safe? Like, I mean, if since the beginning, like I started, I started actually before my first ever show that I even went to really, because I basically just put it there to like help other people. So it started off as a website where I would, cause I, back then I would always like look on eBay and, all these websites for like rare promos and unreleased music and stuff like that. And then I would like put all my music that I, uh, into Winamp and like export it as an HTML list and put it on my website and be like, here are these cool tracks I found. Of course I can't send it to you, but I just letting you know that they're out there. Yeah. Something you may not have heard of. And then when I started taking pictures of DJs, I'm like, you know what, I'll make a gallery and put it on here for the fans of that artist to be like, Oh cool. There's pictures of an artist I actually could go to his website. And back then it was, I did it all in like notepad. So it's just like the most basic HTML, like wow. it looked it like no graphics, just like it was just like textless. And so yeah. I was like, Oh, here's my first gallery. Here's my second gallery, just like in a line. And then I just ended up develop after I started making like a full-time job. Then I said, you know what? I should just put like graphics on this and make it look like a real website <laughs> instead of like yeah. textless. But what's cool is that if you go to it now, I mean, there's just endless, it's a sea of, photos and just, you've covered so much ground. It's, yeah. it's actually insane to like, look at that's your whole history of your work, but also you're selling prints. And did that start? Um, I mean, you talk about, you know, pioneer hitting you up for pictures of your, your DJ photos using their gear was at that time. You're like, Oh cool. I can license my work as a photographer. Now I can get hired to shoot, but also I can sell these after I've shot them. Um, did you, did you tie that into your website early on or was that like a later thing? Um, that was kind of later thing that was around probably like 2010 ish around there. And back then I just put some generic images up and then I worked at a licensing deal with dead mouse. So that way I could put up whatever dead mouse photos I want. And we would just like split the profits. Oh, cool. But at the same time, it's very tough to sell prints because a lot of people just look at as, as, as like an unneeded expense, but a lot of people would be so like, we'll splurge, but I sold them for like pretty cheap. So it kind of made them more like posters. So they're pretty cheap. And I only made like a little bit off of each of them. Right. And it got to the point where like live nation was just like, this is not even worth us dealing with because every quarter we're making like a hundred or 200 bucks you <laughs> yeah. know, for them. And they're just like, this is like nothing to us. So just take it down, stop. And I'm like, okay, I'll take it down. And then for the longest time, I just like forgot about it. And right. then, I did like a few limited edition prints, probably like 
five years later when I did like a little gallery opening and I did like signed a number like 10 or 25 of specific prints and those sold well. And then just recently with the coronavirus hitting, I'm like, you know what? I should bring it back, you know? And yeah. this, I have so much stuff and so many people hit me up for different things. So then I've been in the past month, just like bringing it back and um, hitting up artists and seeing if they want to collaborate. So I got excision so far. He said he's fine with it. Res so far. And then I have a whole list of other artists. So I'm like, hopefully could, put up a lot of artist centric galleries. So when people, for people who don't understand uh, what um, getting approval is, how, <laughs> it, it, how, it, how, you know, people sometimes make the mistake of just selling content that they haven't gotten approved for. How, how do you, yeah. what is your typical process of trying to get things approved for that? And is it usually offering just like, yo, let's, I can split you in on the profits or do you care if I do this? Like, I, I think that's yeah, the challenge is that when we do all this work, you know, we make our rate, which is cool. And, and we, we grow that rate and these artists go out and play their shows and their rates are a billion times what we made that night, obviously. And so just to sell a photo, is it really going to take too much away from these people? But how, what is your strategy for, um, getting permission to sell photos? Um, for, for now, I'm just hitting up the artists directly that I have good rapport with. So I'll just say, Hey, I'm one of our prints. I'd like to sell photos of you. I'm probably not going to make too much money, but if, it, if you want to split it, I'm fine with that. If you want to wait till I make a certain over a certain man, I'm fine with that. And a lot of them are just like, just put it up so far, you know? Yeah. And a lot of them are just like, you know what? We know it's not going to make too much money for you. So unless you start making like hundreds or thousands, then hit us up. But otherwise, you know, just do whatever, you yeah, know, just have fun with it. That's dope. Um, when but yeah, they, they, but you're part of a good point about the whole imaging thing, because a lot of people skirt the, like, the law on that, you know, cause it's like with fine art, you have to, you can do whatever, but you have to limit it to like a sign and two fifty and everything like that. Right. Numbered. But if you want to sell anything as merchandise, just like on demand and everything like that, a lot of people just think, well, the artist hired me so I could just put it right up and they'll put up like a big pop artist or something. And a lot of times I'm like, look at I'm like, I kind of doubt they asked them for that permission, but if they did good, right. but at the same time, it's would be, it'd be horrible for them if all of a sudden their lawyers like take that down right now and give us all the money you gave us and oh, everything yeah. like that. You what know, a bummer. And you spend the yeah. money and then you're getting sued and, and, and then you're also just hurting relationships with those artists. They're never going to wor work with you again. If you, if you're just trying to use their likeness to like sell. So there is a prop, there is definitely a proper channels you should take when, when considering selling the things that you make. Yeah. I mean, I talked to a lot of lawyers even recently just to <laughs> re up my information on it. And yeah. they basically just said, you know, as long as if the, if you look at the photo and you can tell who it is, like I put up a lot of generic photos of production photos, you're fine with that. Right. But if you could tell who the artist is or the artist, the focus of it, you of course have to ask permission because it's like a model release even more. So if the artist lives in California more than 51% of the time of the year, because they have extra laws with really? their likeness because okay. of the whole, selling like celebrities, like on right. merchandise and promoting stuff like that. So people who live in California have even more laws. So you really, really need to get like a hundred percent permission on that. And sometimes even for fine art, depending on who it is, you know, Jesus Christ. Yeah, yeah. definitely. If you're doing it, look into it, please yeah. <laughs> save yourself some headaches. Uh, exactly. when, when you, you know, how, how long did the stint with Dead Mouse go for you? Is it, is it just kind of continuous all um, the time? It started at the end of 2007 and I stopped. I think 2012 sometime. Right. And, and when you did that, was that because you had started building other relationships or were you trying to just kind of stay in one place for a while? I know these people go, are on the go all the time. It, I mean, it got to the point where he was doing the cube pr pr production so much. And I did like so many European and US tours that he basically told me all these tours come up. We really don't need you. We have like a billion cube photos and getting a billion more is not going to really do anything. Right but he always wanted a new production and it kept on getting delayed every year. Like the beginning of every year, the management would be like, okay, we're doing the new production sometime this year. We'll let you know some dates and nothing happened. And then they just kept on going and going and right, going. Right, and right. then he ended up going right back to the cube again. And by that time I'm just like, okay, I'm moving on to the next artist. And of course, really at the same, right at the same, like the day after I just 
stopped doing Dead Mouse, Swedish House Mafia hit me up and like, hey, we're doing one last tour. Do you want to do a bunch of those gigs? I'm like, yeah, perfect. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's so. So how how what what is it about like building the longevity for you um, as a photographer? Like, how are you building? building that momentum so that you can keep that consistent. Like obviously that just ha- it landed on your lap. That's awesome. But you've done it for 15 years. Like this being your start moving towards it. What is it that you're doing when you're working with these artists, working with the production teams and also delivering, obviously you're shooting festivals and, and concerts evolve, but they are similar over and over again. So you're kind of, it becomes repetitive. How do you find the balance there and continue to build your longevity? I mean, it's just basically, spreading out. I mean, for me, touring with artists is getting more and more difficult because a lot, because a lot of artists prefer to just go find someone that'll do it for like pretty cheap because it's going to be expensive to bring someone on the road. So like a lot of the artists I work with, they'll just bring me out for like the biggest gigs, you know, Mm -hmm. because they don't, they really don't want people, you know, they want me taking photos of like tiny production in a smaller venue. They just want me to come out to big ones. So at the same time, a lot more festivals pop up right. and I actually kind of prefer them a little bit because even though I get paid more money and it's a lot more work at the same time, I get to make a lot of artists happy. So I can look at the lineup and be like, cool, I can make like six or five or six artists that I work with happy, even though they're going to bring their own tour photographer. They'll be like, Oh cool. Rooks is here and get some Rooks photos right. them too, you know? Yeah. Did, have, did you ever, with your website, is it, is that all 100% your photos or do you start like hiring people? It almost feel, it looks like you're a goddamn production, like tons of photographers because you've shot so much shit. It, do you ever work with other people under, under your brand or is that always just you? No, it's always been me completely. Wow, that's I mean, incredible. But, but I mean, it, like you said, it's, it's very, with the amount of work I do and the amount of places I go, yeah. it blurs the line because like I'll get people that come up to me and go, oh, you work for Rooks. Rooks is an amazing company, everything. And then I'm like, thank you. And they're like, wait, are you Rooks? I'm like, yeah, I am Rooks. <laughs> and a lot of people are like, oh, your team is so great. You know, can I join the Rooks team? I'm like, it's literally just me. It's always been me. Wow. And for the foreseeable future, it's going to still be me, you know? Yo, yeah, congrats. But That's- I mean, to be able to work so hard and work so much that people will think that it's multiple people is pretty humbling, you know? It's yeah. just like, oh, I definitely feel like I'm doing a good job if people think that on multiple people, I guess. Right. Yeah, man. I, I, I'd be curious to know, um, you know, during the Swedish tours and, and productions and festivals, what were like some standout moments? Cause I think what's cool is like we do so, I mean, one day is exhausting, right? And then you're doing that over and over and over again. And there's just so many cool like moments that can happen. Were there anything that you were, you could reflect on from those tours, those early tours, even with dead mouse that you remember that are just like standout moments for you and, and accomplishments for you? I mean, it's, it's tough because everything blurs together. So I'll ha- I'd have to go through like all the galleries and look and be like, Oh yeah, I remember this. All I remember right. that. But I mean, a lot of the stuff is just like the days off are always pretty fun. Mm. Like with, like you said, with the switch house mafia, like we went to South Africa and like we, I think I just did, I did, we did India and South Africa. I did that leg of the tour. So like we went to India and like the very first gig we went to, it was just like an insane swarm of people. So we like, it's like this huge field with the stage all the way in the back. So we had to take the SUVs and go all the way around to go to the back. Right. And people were just sitting there waiting on the stage and they did the show, the crowd went wild. And then we left and we went the same way back and you just see the entire sea of people look at the van, look at the SUVs we were driving back to the hotel, pointing and then running all the way down. Like thousands and thousands of people running. I mean, everything was gated, but they're just running towards the cars and then everyone's like, Oh my God. (laughs) And then um, we went to like South Africa and we stayed at like probably the best hotel you could stay at in Johannesburg. So it was just like bliss. And then we're, we had some days off. So we were like, Oh cool. Let's go. And let's go to on safari. Let's go to a rescue shelter and play with baby white tigers. And right. let's, let's go to the mall. And let's get some tennis here. Cause it's a tennis court. We'll play some tennis, you know, <laughs> and just like fun little things here and there. Right. And then on the business side, just like seeing, things grow is also pretty cool. Like on the dead mouse tour in 2010, I think the U S tour, he brought Skrillex out as his opener. And this is before he released his first album or anything. Scary monsters, nice, right. So people just heard of one of his songs and that was it. They didn't even know what he looked like and everything. So I'd like take pictures of him opening and everything. Like people would be making fun of him on forums and just like, he looks weird. What's with him and everything like that. And then like three weeks into it, we were in Denver and 
his first album, Scary Monsters and Nice Sprites, comes out, and he's like so excited. He's like, I got the masters, and he gives us all gives us all copies on USBs and everything. And he got his first T shirt merch, and he gave us all T shirts, and he was so excited and happy. Yeah. And as the tour went on, it is like tracks rocketed up on Beatport and just became like the biggest thing in the industry. And it went from people at the beginning of the tour saying, "Who's this freak?" <laughs> to "Oh my God, Skrillex is opening for Dead Mouse. We should just go just for Skrillex." was just insane just watching oh. someone's career grow from like a no, almost nobody opener to like up there with like the headliner yeah that's all on the same tour wild that is wild yeah. is it, it during those times are you when you're, you're you're support you're on tour with you know whoever whoever the main artist is that's hiring you are you finding yourself shooting a lot of the opening shows too and, and just kind of like or, or learning about these openers like in that time to be able to document skrillex rise to fame it's pretty unique position to be in. Yeah. I don't know. Did you, did you take advantage of that or be, you know, being there, are you just always kind of shooting and just capturing things or, or how does that work? I for mean, you? I leave it into the artist's hands because a lot of times they'll have like local openers and like, just don't worry about that. Right. But if it's like someone they believe in, they'll say, you can just get some photos of them, you know, just get a few and everything like that. And I'll do that. You That's know, cool. so it's kind of, yeah, just whatever they want basically, you know, cause right. a lot of like, or like excision, they'll hire me just to shoot excision stuff and all the production stuff. And they'll have, they'll hire someone else to handle the openers, even though I know a lot of the openers and they'd love to have me do photos and yeah. everything like that. So they just don't want to overload me. You know, they don't want me shooting like six sets before the excision one and just being like, Oh my yeah, God, be I more pictures, you know? right. yeah, that's terrible. <laughs> Is it, <laughs> it, it, and then the days off too, are you, is it important for you to, and do you see the, your fin, your fans connecting with this, especially on your website at the time you go in and playing with the lions or going over and playing tennis? Are you documenting that too? Or do you take, are you using that as your day off or would the artists prefer that you're kind of capturing some of those raw moments behind the scenes? I mean, yeah, every, everything I do is I always ask. So like if they if like, let's do, we're going there. Can you want me to take pictures? And usually the answer is of course, to yeah, take right. pictures, you know? So I always make sure to do that. And then I, I balance it, you know, cause I take good pictures and then when I say, look, okay, I got this perfect picture now, I'll just like take advantage of this. And, you know, like one of the places we went to Swedish house mafia, we went to Lori park and they have cheetahs that you can play with okay. and like giant cheetahs with like claws and everything. So I'll let them go in first, take pictures of them interacting. And then like, when I have enough, then I'm like, okay, now I'll go and pet the cheetahs and hope they'll bite my arm off. Right. Yeah. Well, it's a safer <laughs> thing. Cause if they're going to bite your arm off, they're going to bite off Swedish house mafia's hand first. <laughs> yeah. One, one of them I almost actually did. I was like playing with them too much. It was like, it was on its stomach and I was rubbing its stomach and it put its arms like around my hand like this, like to bring me in. Yeah. And then it went to do a playful bite and it just like went like this. It, and you're like, hell and the no. jaws open. And I saw the teeth are like this thick Jesus and I'm like, Whoop, no. Christ. And I'm like, cause I know even though it would be a playful bite, it wouldn't puncture. Yeah. Just like looking at the teeth compared to a cat, I just yanked it back and the, the cheetah just got up, looked at me and then, okay. And walked yeah. away. And <laughs> yeah, it's, like, oh my God. it's not worth dealing with. I'll let you have yeah. your day. Damn. That's yeah. That's, we did that too. When we were in South Africa and got to go and, and, and see a lot of these, it's insane to be around real wildlife. Like, they're, they're, they're beasts. Even when they're babies, they're beasts, bro. Like, holy shit. Yeah. I think one time with, um, I forgot who I was with, but we, uh, I think it was ultra South Africa and we went to the same park and they had a six month old tiger mm -hmm. that they were, that, um, that was going to, um, I think a zoo or something because it was a rescue and like his parents died and right. it had no one to take care of it. And it was just like the hand, the paws were just like gigantic, Huge. the size of their head. And they're just like, start batting everything around and like slapping things. And you're just like, and it's just playing around with everything, chewing on bones. And it's just like the most hyper, it's like a hyperactive kid <laughs> with murder mitts, basically. Yeah, murder <laughs> mitts, damn. Uh, I, I go, going back to photography, could talk about animals all yes. day. This shit's fun. Um, <laughs> with, with the way, you know, you've created your style. What do you think it is about your style that sets you apart from others, uh, to make it like a Rook's photo, you know, you've kind of developed mm -hmm. like this style. How, what is it about that? Um, I mean, the, the main things that I always go for, um, first is symm symmetry. So I try to get as symmetrical as possible and everything, mm. get it as much dead center and everything. Um, I love it being natural. Like I've had some times where like when I first went to raw, I'm like, Ooh, filters are cool and everything like that. But yeah. It's the longest time. I was like against even using like you and like film emulating filters because I just wanted to be 
what it look. I want it to look the way it actually looked in real life. Right. I mean, in recent times I'll tweak a little bit and put some filters on, but I still want to keep it as much as possible mm. to like accuracy, you know, to kind of think more photojournalist instead of having like too crazy, too much crazy stuff going on. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. And I mean, and focus for me is important too. Like I'll take, I just have to be as close to dead on with my focus as possible with what I want. Like, like, if I focus on the, on the DJ and the head moves away a little bit and they're even a little bit out of focus, but even if the picture looks amazing, I'll still trash it because mm -hmm. I'm like that picky about it. You know, I like it to be as close to perfect as possible. Right. I, I, what, what's your kind of setup that you prefer when you're, when you're on the road, what are you taking with you? If you're going to cover a festival or a show, a regular concert, I basically take everything. I have one think tank, uh, airport commuter backpack. Okay. With my one body, my flash, and like nine different lenses. Just and lenses. it all fits perfectly. And it's a bit, it's pretty heavy, but I mean, it's good because a lot of times when I try to downsize in the past, I'd be like, oh, I probably will never need this lens on this tour or something like that. And then like halfway through the tour, I'm like, damn, I could have used that lens right here. Mm -hmm. I know. But like, so like I've got like a 90 millimeter tilt shift lens and that one is probably my least used lens but it's also the one that I try to use as much as possible because if I could get something good out of it, it looks very unique and very amazing. You're using tilt shifts during concerts? Yeah. Oh shit. I've never even thought about that. That would be yeah. fucking Mostly sick. Mostly for production stuff. So like I'll go to the front of house and just like tilt it up and try to get it a little bit blurry. And yeah. especially with like fireworks, it actually looks pretty cool because it makes it, it gives it like some bouquet on the top and bottom and looks focused in the middle. Oh, that's dope. Yeah. That's a great idea. Is it very, very tough to get, get it perfect. But if you get it perfect, then it's amazing. Right. And then I just get the one shot. I'm like, okay, I'm done. Put this away. Let me put on my regular lenses, yeah, please. Yeah. <laughs> is it, is it, are you carrying that bag during the show? Like, so for example, if you're playing a house venue on a tour or, or I don't know what, like a stadium or whatever you're playing at, you can usually, host your, your gear. So you have a kind of a home base. Um, are you doing that often? Or are you just trying to make sure you have like your main assets that you want when you're running around the venue with you at all times? Um, I used to bring everything everywhere and that was just way too much, but mainly now what I do is I keep my backpack with all the gear in the DJ booth or on the main, on the stage. And then I, and then, um, if it's, if it's warm out, then I have cargo shorts and I put like, if I need to go out, like, well, like going back a little bit, if I need, if I go to the front of house, I'll bring, I'll bring my entire gear with me. Mm -hmm. But if I wander a little bit, or if I know that I don't need everything in front of house, if it's like a warm event, I'll wear cargo shorts and I'll put like one or one lens in each of their pockets and right. bring that with me. So then I have three lenses with me to change between. Or if it's cold, then I have a hoodie with like inside pockets and I put a, two lenses in each of those and then I take it out, change it and then change lenses. So that way I always have three lenses with me and I don't have my backpack. Right. Yeah. I thought, that and everything. It's always such a pain. Like I, we, when I would be on the last tour I did, I'm, I'd have like, I'm shooting video and I'd have, you know, sometimes a long lens or a, or, or a Ronin and I'm trying to like have one for just kind of really focusing. So I'll go handheld for that and I'll have the Ronin and I would like go to the top of the stadium and it's such a haul. So I'm like, oh do I want to go yeah. all the way up there with just a Ronin or do I want to pick up some shots while I'm <laughs> so you're like having one over your back here, you got a fanny pack with another lens. I, I've, I've even looked at, you know, there's some people that have some really cool like belts that hold lenses. I've looked yeah. at, I'm like, is it worth it? Uh, but yeah, I actually, I thought about that too, but I don't think it's really worth it too much, especially at festivals, because even though it's easier to use, it's easily also easier for people to steal from it. Mm, shit. Because if they're on your side, people could just walk up to you and just slide it right out. Right. You know? And that's happened to a lot of my friends. I'd go to like a festival, they'd walk to front of house and then someone just like slips the lens out and just runs away and never see it again. Savages. So I prefer to keep it like, if it's in my pockets on my shorts, yeah, no you, one could, it's harder to do it. Or if it's inside my hoodie and the pockets, you know, so I right. definitely go for more security than ease of use for the stuff like that. Yeah. Um, when, when having developed the, the really sometimes, okay. So there's like a spidey sense that you have, right. With yes. being able to capture <laughs> moments. So how, how do you develop that? And, and 
so sometimes you're having shows where you've been with Dead Mouse for years and you've learned the set in and out and you know all the fire the pyro points and all these good moments that you need to capture this in wide or this from behind, et cetera. Um, but then when you're working like a one-off, like say you're at a festival, you said you wanted to make five other artists happy, you have to shoot their set and maybe you're not familiar with some of their newest uh, cues and things like that. What, how do you, how do you balance that and, and understand kind of key moments to capture? Or are you just always prepared? Um, I'm not definitely not always prepared for stuff like that, but I mean, at the same time, it's a lot of social media keeping up to date. So like, if it's like Steve Aoki, I'll follow him on Twitter since we're friends. And then whenever he comes out with a new track, I'll be I'll keep an eye on it. And if it starts getting popular, I'll listen to it and just keep it in my head. So that way, if I'm about to gig of his and I hear that song, I'm like, oh, it's his new track. He's probably going right. to do some big pyro event or something like that. That's cool. But um, a lot of the time, it's just the first thing at festival is just finding the pyro guy and just being like, okay, so what do you have? Yeah. And then they'll be like, we have this, we have this, we have this. Okay. Do you have any fi finale fireworks at the end? Yes, we do. Okay. Perfect. I got the basics down. Then from there, it's waiting for the actual pyro to happen because a different countries and different festivals will have different uh, power for the flames or for the fireworks. And it could be like, Oh, we got flames. And then the flames are like, psh, 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 and just like nothing. And they're right. tiny. In other words, they could just shoot all the way up to the roof and you're like, oh my God, this is perfect. Yeah. So it's just spending the first few times learning and seeing what it does and then just basically practicing. So like I'll try, like if they do flames for the first time, I'll set up for like a, um, a pretty basic settings to capture flames, but not expecting much. And I'll try that and I'll see what the flames look like and how they were exposed. And then from there, just change it into the settings and build them so that way for the bigger DJs when they do it, I'll be like perfectly ready on time with right. the right settings and the right timing yeah, and all that stuff. And then at the same time, a lot of the tour managers for the artists, they know me and they'll be the ones doing the pyro. So I'll like look over to them on like the pyro booth and they'll just be like, this yeah, so and then perfect. And then I just get prepared and everything. That's like that. clutch. Yeah. Is it, how, how has it been like 15 years ago, you know, you started this game <laughs> and production has, I mean, EDM production, I'm always jealous because I've never shot an EDM show at all. But I'm like, those shows look fucking nuts. There's so much pyro. There's so many <laughs> sparkler looking things flying on the air, uh, smoke and shit. I'm like, there's just so much happening on these stages. And then the stages get so big. You know what I mean? Like yeah. massively big. <laughs> Avalon, sick. Now you're shooting some stages that are like 300 foot long with like the biggest screens. How, how has it been more recently with the amount of artists that are coming out, the amount of money being spent on productions, um, them relying on photography to explain to their fans, like my show is the shit. This is why it's the shit. Here's a bunch of examples of why it's the shit Buy a ticket. You know what I mean? How has that, how has that transition been for you? And then also dealing with, um, you know, everyone else has their photographers, people bite styles or, or you're building a community, uh, in general, like this transition period for you. I mean, yeah, like I said, it's just a lot of artists will just specifically bring me out for the big events just to show the case them and then have like a tour photographer fill in the gaps and get some more casual stuff. But um, yeah, it's been, it's been crazy watching it grow from just like no pyro, just like LED panels and production. And the funny thing I noticed is like the stages get higher and higher. So it's like the first like festivals that I would do like at the beginning when like I was, we started working for ultra, just feel like a DJ booth in the front on the bottom. And then I could just go behind, do a fish shot, stand up right behind, cool get the crowd, everything. But then the DJ is, well, I want my stage a little bit higher. And then, Oh, I want a bigger led wall. So I want even higher. And then it gets, then it gets to the point where it got so high that I'm like, okay, I need a monopod to get behind and up and over yep. to tilt it down more just so it get the crowd and everything like that. Jesus. <laughs> but yeah, you got 10 yeah, foot and stages. Like I said, it's also been, it, it also is a little difficult with competition. Like I don't look at other photographers as competition or everything because we all have our own styles and we all do our own things and there's room for everybody. But there are a lot of people, artists that are just like, well, I want what he does. I could do better than him. So I'll try to mm. push them out, you know, and a right. lot of people that are like, no, we're going to use you. But it's just like, there are some toxic people in the industry that are just like, you know, very just like, competition wise when it doesn't have to be competition. I of mean, course. there are a lot more photographers than before and less spaces for those photographers, but there's still a lot of artists and a lot of room to grow in different directions. Right. You know? 
I can't do everything. So it's like, <laughs> yeah, of course, that's the one like all the way up until like probably like 2012, I was, I was kind of like doing just about everything almost. It felt like in the industry, like when Coachella would hit and they would have the Sahara tent with all the DJs in the lineup, I would just do all of them. I'd just like stay at the Sahara tent. They'll all hire me like Alessio, Calvin Harris, Dylan Francis. They'd just be like, okay, Rooks is here on the stage. It says Rook, like the stage manager, um, the Sahara stage is like, okay, this is Rooks' stage. You do whatever he wants, you know, no one bug him, yeah, that right. type of thing. And then it got to the point where it just was like, I think the big turning point for when I was like, I can't do everything was when um, around like 2013, 2014, when more festivals were popping up. And then you, well, cause back then it used to be like, Oh, here's EDC. And then it'd be like three months before another big festival. Right. So I was able to spread it out pretty well. Like here, I'll do the festivals and I'll do artists in between. But then when it got to be like festivals every month all over the place, I think the big one was um, Calvin Harris. I toured with him for a few years and he basically stopped touring because he was just like, I'm done with this. I don't want to do this. I'll just work on albums and everything like that. And by the time he started touring again, I was already busy. So I'm like, I can't do the Like, like I'd get hit up for like one of his gigs, like two, like I think the one was, um, I was flying to ultra Europe in Croatia and when I landed in Croatia, I got hit up by them. Oh, we're doing cream fields in the UK uh, tomorrow. Can you, can you do it? I'm like, I'm literally just tomorrow. landed in Croatia. <laughs> I can't do this. Please find someone else. And then at that point I was like, I can't do everything. Some other people have to do all their stuff. You know, right. it's like there are so many artists and it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger that it needs more people. And right. thankfully it spreads start spreading out. How, how do you pick and choose your battles right now? What, what has been kind of your process of, of managing your time, um, and, and staying busy, but also, you know, taking care of your people. Cause you have so many, you literally know like everyone in the game to the point where yeah. everyone's just like, yep, Roos has his state. The entire stage is his, <laughs> give it to him. Um, how do you manage that? Uh, I, a lot of planning. So it's like, I'll see if an artist announces like a big one off, like a Red Rocks gig or a Palladium gig, I'll put in my calendars pending and have my manager hit them up and figure it all out. And it's just a lot of, you know, like I said, it's just a lot of putting together the pieces, you know, like a festival is going to be here and giving priority to some things. Like I give priority to more international festivals to like, because it's fun to travel of course yeah. and see new things but also that spreads my brand around the world. So like if a festival is playing in like the U S and ones in like Japan, I'll be like, I'm doing Japan no matter what, you know? Right. 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 And, um, yeah, the same with artists things. Usually it's, it gets down to just like the budget, you know, cause sure. like some artists will be like, we only have this amount to do it, but then someone else come by, well, we have this amount to do this one. So I'll just pick that one. Yeah. And at the same time, I want money aside, I always balance relationships too. That's very, very important. So like if someone's coming out with new production, I'll definitely give them priority over someone with the same production because it'll help them out versus people that I already shot for, even if it means less money. And at the same time, you know, I'll owe the person that I miss something else. So like, I'll mm -hmm. be like missing a gig for like above and beyond to do like a gig for like someone else, like Eric Crids. But then I'll say, okay, I'll owe above and beyond a gig and I'll give them priority next time, you know? Right. No, that's a good so it's system. a lot of shuffling like that and keeping everybody happy and not making it seem like I'm giving up on anybody. Right. It's basically saying I'm busy, I'm sorry, but I'll make it up to you, you know? Right. I'm just one person, man. <laughs> exactly. I'm just one person. <laughs> oh, shit. Um, what, what's your future plans? What do you got? I mean, obviously coronavirus has kind of stolen everybody out. Uh, how have you been taking advantage of the time? But then what, what's what's the plan once it's kind of, you know, the Wild Wild West opens up again? I mean, just basically chilling, watching Netflix, just catching up on shows and working on the Prince store that I have. Yeah adding more artists like every two weeks and everything like that. And, um, yeah. And then my guy got hit up by a few artists about they're doing books oh, cool. and they want to license some photos. So um, I can't say who, but, right. uh, those are TBD. And of course those take forever. Yeah. And then also at the same time, I'm thinking this coronavirus is a good end point for like my career for like making a book myself, because for years I'd be like, I'd love to make a book, but where do I stop? Because yeah. if I stop here, 
then the next day do a uh, festival that has amazing pictures. I'll be like, Oh, I wish I could do the, put those pictures right. in. But now I'm thinking I could do it like everything for 15 years up to the coronavirus, you know, and then that's a good end point. That's crazy. But of course it's tough to find a publisher or someone that like cares about dancing music and yeah, right. photo books and everything. So I'm, I'm working out some things and just like looking around. I'm not making it major because since I have an end point, I could come back to that end point at any time, you know? Yeah, of course. Damn, man. I, I, having worked with pretty much everyone in the game and having a, a, a long career, 15 years, bro. Like that's insane. And it's definitely yeah. not over. What, what do you feel like it is about you and your work that makes these artists come back to you? That makes you stand out that you really believe is one of your best traits as a creator that other people listening could take and walk away and implement that into their field. I mean, it's basically just working with your limits. That's always the one thing that I always go by is like, if you, whatever like access you have, like if you have limited access, do the best you can with limited access. Don't try to force your way into the situation. Like if you have just a photo pass, don't try to sneak backstage because if you piss people off, then that's very bad, you know? Yeah. And it's just basically setting limits. So like if uh, someone has production, like Avicii had his big production head that like went over the crowd and everything. And I just, the first thing I said is, okay, what can it, and it can't do. And they're like, well, I probably can't go in the head because it's very little room and it's not that stable up there. So I'm like, perfect. I won't go up there, you know, yeah. and just keeping things said and just like, can I go there? Can I go there? You know, and just being, and just working with them, you know, that's always the best because they don't want someone that's doing whatever they can going crazy, getting themselves in trouble, getting the artists in trouble for doing something bad, you know, and, you know, just trying to expand. So like, I'll, Hit a, like before I even try something new, I'll ask the artist that I'm with. I'm like, Hey, I've got this. Do you mind if I try some of this out? This is what it might look like. Yeah. Like, yeah, sure. You know, just making sure everyone's on the same page. So there's no surprises. That's always been a key for me, you know? Yeah. It's a great piece of advice. Uh, it's keeping that open line of communication and, and just being responsible is goes a long way. Yeah. Cause I mean, the worst last thing you want to do is some, an artist says, okay, we want you to take pictures of this event. And then you don't ask them what specifically they need, like what big songs will have like a special guest or something like that. Or if you're just, if they just want photos, you just do a video and then they say, Oh, why'd you do a video? We wanted photos of this. You know, you gotta yeah. make sure that your client is happiest. And then what you need to do on the side, make sure they're okay with that. You know? Mm, yeah, no, I agree. Um, dude, I appreciate you coming on here and sharing this with us. I think you've, you've, accomplish a shit ton and it's fucking cool to check that out um if there's anything mm -hmm. else I'll, I'll put links to i'll put links to your store in the description as long as, as well as your instagram you already got a whopping oh. 248k followers that's awesome <laughs> so unfortunately that's not the most accurate Isn't based it? on my reach because i think i think i had like 160 or something when i stopped using instagram a while ago and then back then you could post stuff and tons of people would like, like stuff and it would oh, yeah. grow like crazy. Like I was growing like a thousand new followers a week and Jeez, everything like that. Surprise. And it was doing pretty good. But the one thing that really kind of hit the artificial number wrong was, um, when I was working with Zed and he worked with Selena Gomez and Selena Gomez followed me on Instagram. <laughs> and then I got like 20,000 new followers, like, over like a period of a month and right. they're just like all Selena fans looking for Selena pictures. <laughs> I post one and just to blow up. Yeah. Don't post one. They don't give a crap. Uh, yeah, you know? I, and I, then I so I've been at the point now I'm like, I'm posting less because of the coronavirus, but yeah. I'm, so my numbers are going down a little bit slowly, but it's good because it's getting rid of all the people that are like, that's hilarious. Junk, you know, the junk followers, I'll let them disappear. I'd rather have like 240,000, followers and like 255,000 yeah. that not being accurate, you know, no, of kind course. of a stickler for the numbers. Yeah. Now we, I literally just had a conversation with, uh, Ashley Osborne. She was on the podcast a week before this episode drops. And we had a whole conversation about that and, and what it does for people. Cause a lot of creators have this like 
creative anxiety about that. Oh fuck, the number's going down and people are going to think less of me and all this shit. <laughs> but it's like, sometimes you have people that come there for one thing. And if you can just get rid of it, you have your real fans. They're going to really react to exactly, what you want yeah. for them to react. And that's a good thing. Well, shit, man, yeah. thank you for doing this. We got to get you in here sometime to tell the, the whole thing in its entirety. Cause that's usually what we do behind wherever yeah, that desk we'll is. Do, uh, we'll do a six hour director's <laughs> cut up. Yeah, I like that. <laughs> well, shit, man, stay safe. Appreciate you. And, and thanks Thank for doing this. Thanks for having me. Yep. All right. That's it for episode 191. Huge shout out to Rooks for coming on the show. Make sure to subscribe to Black Window Cream on whatever podcast platform you are listening to. And if you support this podcast and want to connect with us a little bit farther for future updates on podcast episodes and uh, to find out ways that you can get involved with the growth of Black Window Cream, shoot us a text 319-209-9041 or you can hit the link in the description. Also, if you super enjoyed this episode, leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. That shit helps us out so much with the growth of this thing. You can post a screenshot of this episode on your IG story and let us know what your biggest takeaways are. We will repost the best ones and make sure to tag at Black Window Cream so we see what you're saying. All right, that's it. Enjoy the work week. Keep creating. We will see you in a few days, you...